in its current implementation, which we are going to uh, uh, also give you a chance to play with tomorrow, uh, we have uh, stopping boundaries for efficacy and futility. The trial will stop the first time that any of these multiple arms crosses an efficacy boundary, or if all arms cross a futility boundary, it'll stop. Uh, but in addition, as you go along look by look, you can drop the losers. So uh, any, any, any individual arm that crosses a futility boundary can be discarded, and uh, or the remaining arms can keep going. Uh, uh, and only if every single arm crosses the futility boundary would you stop the trial entirely. Uh, now, under development, also for E6.4, uh, are uh, these two features, which is, in addition to dropping losers, actually making an active selection at an interim analysis if you, if you want to kind of just look at the winners and say, uh, although, although, we, although there were some losers that didn't cross the futility boundary, at this point, I only want to choose arm um, one or two. You can do a selection, and we can also do a sample size re-estimation. Now, the, um, the mathematical framework of, of two-arm and k-arm uh, uh, and multi-arm uh, with multiple looks is very similar. Uh, you can see uh, that you know, uh, the probability equations are very similar, except for the fact that uh, here you have only one W, which is a score statistic uh, at, at each look, whereas uh, in the in the multi-arm, you have D of these, W1, W2 through WD. But otherwise, the, the essential idea is the same. So here is a picture uh, of the two-arm case where uh, these E1, E2, and E3 are the boundaries that you really want to know. You want to know what these E1, E2, and E3 should be. And, uh, and at each look, you're getting a W1, W2, and W3. And any time you cross this, you stop and declare victory. So uh, the, the main thing in a two-arm trial is that these Ws are scalars. And the trial stops the first time that one of these Ws crosses the boundary. Uh, and what we want is that the probability of, uh, of at, le at least once crossing this boundary is alpha. The probability of crossing at the first look or continuing and stopping at the second look or uh, continuing to the first two looks and stopping at the third, that should be alpha. And these computations for getting E1, E2, E3 are greatly simplified because of an important property of independent increments, which is that this Wj is independent of the increment from Wj minus 1 to, sorry, Wj minus 1 and Wj minus Wj minus 1 are independent. They're independent increments. And that allows you to get these boundaries very quickly and very efficiently. Now, in the multi-arm situation, what you are dealing with is that these Ws are vectors. Each W consists of a d-dimensional vector. And you're going to do essentially the same thing, but you're going to be looking at the max, at the maximum of these Ws at each look. And you want the probability that the max of the, at the first stage crosses E1 or it remains in the continuation region, and the max of, this, uh, of, of the Ws at the second stage crosses the E2 and, uh, and similarly the third stage, and you want this to be alpha. And now the computations get complex uh, because uh, these Ws are, uh, are correlated, but, but there's no independent increment property for when you deal with the max. On the other hand, uh, there is one redeeming feature that the vector wj and its independent increment are independent. So you have, you have independent increments across stages, but within a stage, you don't have independent increments. So you have a, a sort of a, a multivariate normal integration with independent increments across stages. And that makes the thing fairly complicated. Now I'm going to illustrate this uh, implementation in East with the enhanced trial, which uh, actually has been published by uh, statisticians from Novartis, uh, 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 Frank Bretz uh, is one of the co-authors, and uh, uh, they used uh, the, the, the other approach. They used the uh, uh, combination testing and, clo uh, and close testing approach. Uh, anyway, here is, uh, this is a, 
a, a study with four arms, three, three doses and placebo, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a COPD trial. The end point, the primary end point is the V12 change from baseline in uh, 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 FEV1. The uh, expected differences from placebo, so there'll be three comparisons uh, with placebo, and the expected differences are between 0.14 and 0.18 liters with a sigma of 0.5. Let's say we want to design this for 90% power at a one-sided alpha of 0.025. But first of all, if you had only a two-arm trial uh, and you had three looks, a two-arm, three-look group sequential design, uh, you can easily put that into yeast, and you can see, well, I need, uh, I need about 165 patients per arm for doing this with two arms and three looks. Now, uh, now you want to go to four, uh, uh, four arms, then uh, then you can, you can do it this way. Uh, you, you specify that you have three looks, you specify that you have four arms, and uh, you want 90% power, and uh, you, you can specify uh, the, the means that you, I'm, I'm now designing for three means of 0 0.18, 0 0.18, and 0 0.18, with an allocation equal, equally, equally allocated, and a sigma of 0.5, and then I can press the compute button, and, uh, and I'll get, uh, uh, the output which I've saved over here, and this output says that now uh, I need I need 130 patients per arm rather than 165 per arm uh, for for the two arm case. So the question is why did I uh, why do I need fewer patients per arm when I've got uh, four arms compared to two? Well, there's more chance there's more chances of of crossing. Uh, a boundary if I've got four arms instead of two. On the other hand, uh, the boundary has got to be stricter because under the null hypothesis also I've got more chances of crossing uh, that, that boundary. And so it's interesting to look at the boundary for two arms compared to the boundary for four arms. But before doing that, we can ask ourselves, well, you know, I designed this trial with a uh, I designed this trial for uh, for uh, a difference of 0.18 on each of the three. Uh, what would have happened, for instance, if I had had only one arm active, or, uh, and the other two arms were not as effective? Supposing they had been uh, only uh, 0.18, and then 0.14, and 0.14, and that's my uh, second uh, design. And now I see that, uh, well, now I need many more patients per arm. Now I need 671 patients, 168 per arm, rather than 130 per arm. And that's because now I've got, uh, uh, you know, a weaker, a weaker alternate hypothesis. Uh, there's only, uh, only one arm has a difference of 0.18 from placebo. The other two have 0.14. And therefore, uh, there's less chances of crossing. And therefore, if I want 90% power, I'm going to need more patients. So then, uh, next thing to do is you ask yourself, well, you know, let's, let's look at the boundaries. What, what do the boundaries look like for, the, for these two different uh, designs? One which is a two-arm design and one which is a four-arm design. So here you can see. This uh, three equally spaced looks. This is a classic O'Brien Fleming boundary for three equally spaced looks uh, with a Z statistic of 3.7, 2.5, and 1. Point, you know, close to 1.96. An O'Brien Fleming boundary is pretty conservative uh, at the last look. You know, you spend some alpha along the way, but it's very close to 1.96. Not so with the forearm trial. Now the final uh, criterion is much stricter. It's two point, almost 2.4. 
in order to preserve the type 1 error. And, uh, and that, that's why, uh, you know, uh, so there's a sort of trade-off. On the one hand, uh, this red boundary, which is for four looks, four, four arms, is much higher than the blue boundary, which is for uh, two arms. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you've got, uh, f you know, uh, four, uh, three chances to cross the red boundary. Uh, because there are th three different comparisons, you only have one chance to cross the blue boundary. So sometimes the sample size might be greater for the two arm, sometimes the sample size might be greater for the four arm, depending on the alternate hypothesis. Now, uh, the next thing that you want to do is you want to see well, what, what about if I introduce a futility boundary in here? I want, I want to stop early uh, if all the arms cross, and I want to drop the loser. So uh, that's where the computations can get quite difficult, when you have both an efficacy and a futility boundary. So uh, I'm going to do this, this design with 671 patients, but I'm going to do it with, a, uh, with, a, with the presence of a futility boundary thrown in. So uh, let's, let's say that we want uh, 671 patients. And uh, we're going to keep this 0 0.18, 0 0.14, and 0 0.14. Uh, but the introduction of a futility boundary is, is going to uh, you know, uh, cause us to lose some power. So uh, now here it is. This is the, the, uh, it's a non-binding futility boundary, so the, this efficacy zone is not changing. And the, but the futility zone, so either, either you stop here for efficacy, or you drop a loser at these looks, or you terminate entirely for futility if all the arms cross. And uh, we can. Uh, use this and uh, and compute and uh, this if we can look at this one more carefully and uh, what what we see we've, we've still got the same sample size 671 patients but uh, the power the power is displayed over here It's slightly less. You lost about 1% in power by introducing that futility boundary. But you have certain advantages now. Uh, you can stop early under the null hypothesis. And you can also drop losers along the way. So uh, let's now uh, look at this in, in somewhat more detail. Uh, here you see the look by look. Uh, this is the stopping boundary scale on the efficacy and futility scale. Uh, this uh, over here is the is the boundary uh, so-called exit probabilities. You see, well, under the under the null hypothesis. Uh, you, you might stop right away at that very first look, or there's an 80, certainly an 85% chance that you will exit by the second look. And uh, you know, overall, uh, uh, there's only a 2.5% type 1, less than a 2.5% type 1 error, and 88% power. Now, what we would like to do is investigate further the properties of this design which has a, it has an efficacy boundary and it has a futility boundary. Uh, what we want to know is uh, uh, how often will you drop losers along the way? What, what will happen look by look? And, and then you might want to also investigate what will happen look by look with this design if, uh, if you have some different uh, uh, values for the 
treatment uh, effects. If, what, for example, if, if only, only one treatment was active and the other two were completely inactive, for instance.